What are the time and all that kind of great stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. Good. Prepare to be disappointed. <laughs> well, that's right. Set that expectations low. And with that, thank you. So should we do this again next year? Yeah. 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 All right. Cool. All right. So make sure you fill out those evaluations and tell us what to do better. If you didn't get one, there's still some at the front desk. Because we are going to still give some stuff away, too. The only way to win something is to turn in the evaluation. All right. So our next speaker is Ben Jackson. Ben spends his time enjoying being a husband, dad, aww. <laughs> I have a very understanding wife who lets me go to security conferences. I plug that in. Absolutely. She's not here, though. No. I don't want to push her. <laughs> yeah. And messing around with anything that has a button dial or blinking light on it. He was the author of Asterisk Hacking by El Sevier Publishing, has spoken at various conferences, and on all that conference with it. And has appeared on various media outlets discussing security and privacy. Ben strongly dislikes Thursdays. Okay. And we'll be writing, there you go. And writing about himself in third person. Ben Jackson. Thank you, Patrick, for that illustrious introduction. Uh, this is blitzing with your defense, attacking, um, sorry, adjusting your strategy to hit attackers on their blind side. Uh, 72 slides in 50 minutes, so hang on. Uh, so for the, for the outline, I'm going to go over the background of why we should adjust our strategy. We're going to talk about developing intelligence, uh, getting information to develop that intelligence, either receiving or gathering, and also sharing said information. Uh, I'm going to dab a little bit in active defense, uh, so uh, not too much because I don't want all the copyright issues. And then finally, tying it all together. But first, about me. Um, I'm a normal infosec professional by day. Uh, thoughts, here, th thoughts expressed here are neither the opinions or beliefs of my employer. I think about three of you know exactly where I work, but the rest of you, I'm not telling you. Uh, I work in a SOC. I wish my SOC looked that impressive. I also do uh, incident response. I always wanted to be a firefighter when I had kids, and um, I figured incident response because I like computers. Hey, why not? Uh, they get a shinier truck, but they don't, I don't live in burning buildings. Uh, I'm a crazy researcher by night. I uh, like to, uh, my 15 minutes of fame were uh, from a thing with uh, Larry called I Can Stalk You, where we basically uh, mine every geotag picture on Twitter. Um, if anyone from the NSA is here, you're spending $20 million on Prism, I can do it cheaper. <laughs> uh, I like to dabble in rip apart malware and um, other things. <laughs> so, uh, background, or why we're totally screwed. Uh, but first off, a disclaimer. Uh, you really can't do what I'm going to talk about unless you're passionate. Uh, and also, for another warning, there's going to be a lot of football references in here, as you by the title slide. Uh, Tom Brady doesn't look as football as a 9-to-5 job. If you really want to get good into sex, you really, don't, you really can't look at it as a 9-to-5 job. Uh, blitzing is a different way to look at it, but it isn't a cure-all. Again, if you're not doing patching, you're going to be doomed. Uh, every defense requires fundamentals, whether it be patching, monitoring your antivirus environment for those occasional hits where they're actually right, um, if your if defense can't run a tackle, your blitz isn't going to uh, be very effective. So right now we're in a prevent defense. So how many here actually pay attention to football? Oh wow, look at that! Wow, this is like the biggest number of raised hands I've seen in one of these presentations. So a prevent defense is American football of defensive alignment, the goal of which is to prevent the opposing offense from completing a long pass. Essentially, for you non-football viewing people, when you get over a touchdown and it's running toward the end of the game, you'll see the defense spread out and attempt to block the uh, block the touchdown. Uh, they'll accept a small amount of yardage, and you'll have to uh, what they'll do it as a cost of time. So, prevent defenses don't work. Uh, we can't prevent 100 percent of the time, and attackers are always okay with gaining that short play. They have time; we don't. Occasionally, the defense will give up the big play still. Uh, RSA, Komodo, Bit9, Broncos versus Ravens in the AFC playoffs. Um, we are giving up yardage to burn time. Unfortunately, we don't have a clock that we can run out of. So the insert response model. Uh, anyone who has your GCIH probably can recite this in their sleep. Preparation, identification, payment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. Uh, learn it, live it, love it. Uh, if you want to go into a Sam's reading room, Patrick Crawl did a nice little write-up on this in 2011. It does a very good explanation of the uh, Sam's uh, uh, method. Uh, you can also go and do your GCIH with probably John Strand. Uh, highly recommend it. He taught me. So, incident response model is geared toward handling incidents and separate events. So, it was essentially created back in like the mid 2000 when we were recovering from Blaster or 
uh, NIMDA, where each event was a separate uh, thing. A separate, each incident was a separate event. Uh, once the fire is out, it's kind of business as usual. Uh, it's good for handling viruses, isolated attacks, uh, and casual attackers, but it's less than ideal for handling APT. Right. <laughs> it's bought it. Uh, so again, the incident, re incident response model still works. Learn it, live it, love it. Uh, however, the game really has kind of changed, and you kind of need a wider awareness within your network. Uh, incidents may be independent, or they may be linked. So the bad guys have a model too. Uh, the, there was a bunch of very smart people from Lockheed Martin. Uh, they created an actual scholarly paper called Intelligence Driven Computer Network Defense Informed by Analysis of Adversary Campaigns and Intrusion Kill Chains. You can tell why I had to read that directly from the slide because there's no way in hell I can remember that. Uh, Hutchins Clopper at the end of 2010. When I read this, it was like coming to Jesus moment. It was like, these guys get it. I've been kind of having this ideas that we should really need to change things. And they're the first that were actually able to articulate it in a way that, you know, much better than I could. Um, it, one of the big things they came out with was they described the steps an adversary would use to gain access to your network. So the intrusion kill chain, as they call it, uh, it was a seven-step process. It had reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and actions and objectives. Now, what exactly does that mean? Recon, you want to find out about your target. Weaponization, once you find out about your target and what they're running, let's find an exploit. Go to Packet Storm, do whatever. Um, people might still use Packet Storm, or they might use Snow Exploit. Yeah, I'm still, I'm old school. Um, delivery, once you have that exploit, actually deliver it some way. Spear phishing, deface, attacking a website that's currently facing, you know, some type of misconfigured server that's out on their network. Um, exploitation, where you can actually run that exploit and uh, attack, uh, attack it. And uh, then from installation, start putting your code on there, establish command and control server, and then you can control that code, and then start actual trading your data, or whatever your objectives are for that thing. You know, wipe the network clean for all you care. So basically, the two kind of work together. Uh, so you have your incident response team and you're prepared, and at some point, somebody's going to come along and start actually scanning your networks, developing exploits, exploiting these servers, and once they actually have that toehold on your network, it's what's recalled to as attacker free time. I've also heard it referred to as quell time. Uh, the, uh, I'm gonna forget exactly what the report that really came up with this was. Um, if you Google NERC HILF, N-E-R-C-H-I-L-F, it's the nuclear, no, the National Energy Regulatory Commission, and they did a report on high impact, low frequency events. Um, apparently they didn't actually have anyone from cybersecurity because they would know this was a lot more than low frequency events, because this happens on a daily basis. Uh, they came up with a, a lot, this, uh, basically this chart. Uh, so once you have that attacker free time, eventually your analysts are gonna say, well, hey, why is that server phoning home to Latvia? And they'll have that identification, and they'll start trying to contain it. Once containment starts, uh, I refer to it as a second step called, uh, the attacker's gonna have a flight or flight syndrome. Um, they're either going to attempt to pivot more into your environment and leave breadcrumbs behind, so that you don't detect them and they can come back later, or they're just going to declare it, blown off, destroy everything in all the logs of their, uh, all the evidence of their intrusion and just run. Uh, then, then as the incident response team, you'll, as the incident response team, you'll eventually eradicate them and everything's done. However, it isn't that simple. So you could get one attacker coming back again and again and again, and essentially it's the same system over and over again. Um, or you could actually have, if you're very unlucky, uh, two groups of attackers, or basically, possibly even the same attacker doing two separate um, operations against you at the same time. So we need to uh, learn bad actors' tactics, techniques, and procedures. We need to tie multiple incidents in a cohesive picture, uh, and we need to feed that back into the existing response model. Once we do that, we can shorten or eliminate the attacker's dwell time or free time. So how do we do this? Uh, developing intelligence, basically. Uh, we know they're going to know about us when they start scanning us and start looking at all the public information about our companies or our networks. Uh, <coughs> we can start doing the same to them. So, intelligence was the big buzzword of RSA this year. Threat intelligence. We can sell intelligence. You know, you can you know rent our intelligence for a week if you really want to. Um, I really wish all these people who are selling intelligence were around when I was in high school. I could have gotten some better grades. Um, <laughs> 
Unfortunately, most people don't know what intelligence is. Uh, I didn't know what intelligence was until uh, I started talking to one of my uh, bosses in my job who has a part-time as uh, Air Force, and he's part of the Air Force Reserve, and he, I was talking, oh, well, this is all intelligence, and he's like, no, that's data, and I was like, well, what do you mean? Um, we go start talking about data to intelligence in the next slide, but uh, basically everything that we think is intelligence is actually data. I, uh, in, in, indicators compromise, IP addresses, fully qualified domain names, uh, MD5s of Valor, all that is data, none of that's actually intelligence. Intelligence is what happens when you take that data and you add analysis to it. So I think the simplest way to do this is uh, to talk to the Star Wars model. I actually kind of borrowed this from a book I was reading. Um, I completely forget the name of the book, but I thought this name was hilarious. So, at the beginning of Star Wars, we see Princess Leia trying to escape the Empire um, after she has stolen planes from the Death Star. And at the end of Star Wars, we see Luke, R2-D2, Han, and Chew Chewbacca uh, blow up the Death Star. Data to intelligence. Right? Intelligence, you know, Tinshus Leia had that intelligence, and she, you know, somehow gave out the Luke, and they had their big thing, and they found that vulnerability. Uh, what they don't show you is the Rebel and Al Alliance and Analysts review these plans and actually find that vulnerability. I assume that they did some type of responsible disclosure with the Empire, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, you're going to attack us, but here, you know, you have three weeks to solve this problem, then we're going to blow up your desktop. <laughs> At least that's what I tell myself, because I like responsible disclosure. So, data to intelligence is a process. So that we can just, you can make intelligence from data fairly easily. Just when you start to want to do good intelligence, it's hard. So, easy. What are we seeing? Well, we're seeing a bunch of the server phone home Lafayette. How do we see it? Well, we saw it with our firewalls, or we saw it with our intrusion detection system, or we saw it with our anomaly detection software. Okay, harder is, okay, what is it doing? It's going and phoning home, it looks like it's a command and control server and it's trying to exfiltrate data. Well, what is it after? Um, okay, it looks like it's trying to connect to a SQL server, that's where we keep our custom database. It must be under, must be trying to grab that data. Uh, why is it after that? Fraud, you know, are they trying to grab our customer database to uh, some type of industrial espionage? That's a very hard question to answer. And the most difficult question is attribution, who's behind it? Um, if you can answer those two last questions, um, find out what you're doing and try to sell it because there's going to be a lot of people who want to buy whatever you're doing. So intelligence is hard work when you're trying to develop it. You're going to spend long days looking like a conspiracy nut. You're going to be locking yourself in your room. You're going to have all the pictures across the wall, you know, certain you know, pictures with uh, uh, people with no faces with big question mark on them, and you're going to have the rubber bands with the pin marks. Um, <laughs> And you're going to have all that, and you're going to get another single piece of data, and everything is going to be blown, and you're going to be back to square one. Uh, it needs to be going, needs to be an ongoing internal process to your business. No one knows your network better than you. And if there's ways of getting some intelligence from other third-party sources. Um, again, unless they know exactly what your business is, and you start actually using, maybe even using that intelligence to develop a more complete picture of how it affects you as a business, uh, it's, it's, that's how that should be your end goal. Uh, threat actors will change on a regular basis. I mean, go back about a couple years ago, right before Anonymous came on the scene, or who could predict who, who could have predicted that? Um, again, if you did, you were really good. Please find a way of like you know selling that. Uh, but once you become proficient in the intelligence process, it's really worth its weight in gold. So using your data, and actually I wrote this slide much longer before Prism came out, but so if it works for the NSA, it can work for you. Apparently, I was very uh, pernicious on that. Um, so, data for intelligence is being sent to your company you know, every day. You know, you have every attack, whether it's successful or not, will result in data. You know, IP addresses for an exploit, uh, command and control server, fully really qualified domain name, the themes of the fishes or the spear phishing. Uh, that's all data, and that's something that you can use. Uh, most attackers really don't have good offset. If anyone went to Allison's talk earlier today, you can learn that they like to brag. Um, they're lazy, so use this against them. Uh, there's a uh, good presentation, I believe it was from Hacking Box last year, from by the Grub Queue on Twitter. Um, it's called Offset for Hackers. It's really great. You, um, it's, the goal is to have people, you know, get, the goal is to go over and teach hackers better Offset. Um, if you actually look at this from a defender point of view, it actually showed a lot of good things that you can use and how the FBI kind of busted Anonymous and certain and where 
certain bits of data that they thought were inconsequential were then eventually built up to uh, use search warrants and execute search warrants against those people, uh, against which point they were then arrested. So what you, the first step is you should be starting busting out of silos to get this data. Then start extracting data out of your SIM, out of your IDS, your AV solution, uh, other security devices. Uh, the best advice to do this is learn how to script. It's an incredible force multiplier if you have a basic amount of scripting. Um, learn Python. Apparently, if you learn, you know, once you get six weeks of Python experience, you're as good as every other Python developer on the planet. <laughs> um, once you extract that data, you can start forming timelines. You know, did that IP probe us last year again and again this year? Is it around a certain time frame? Do we run a report around that certain time frame that they might be interested in? That's something that someone might be interested in. Or can, could it be something where you're seeing something where, hey, that IP address came against, against us last week. Maybe they did their initial reconnaissance and now they're try, attempting to try to exploit us. Uh, pay attention to attack methods and start uh, looking for patterns. Uh, humans still eat machines for pattern recognition. Uh, unfortunately, that sometimes doesn't work out as well. Like we will see, you know, oh, look at that, it's Elvis and a side of toast. Uh, but we do have that, we still do beat machines in that uh, area. So right here I have five different attacks. So attack number one was a spear phishing email. Um, we have a source IP of WXYZ. It targeted a certain group of people within our business. They used a certain exploit. Uh, command and control server was abcdf.com. Attack number two came in via social media, kind of like Spearfish. Had a different source IP. Um, targets were the same group of people in the attack number one. Used a different, used a different uh, vulnerability and it also used a uh, different command and control server. Attack number three, email again, but it also went and attacked a different group of people. Um, attack number four came in via email and also came, used the same um, used a different exploit and also uh, had, uh, went to puppy.com as the command control server. Attack number five was a watering hole uh, attack. Uh, various targets, various exploits. However, it did use the same command and control server as attack number one. So are these five different attacks? Or do they actually maybe equate into one persistent attack with attack number four maybe being the same or maybe being different? Once you actually start putting these pieces of data and correlating them like this, you actually start getting a better uh, picture of what may be happening to you or your network. Uh, this was actually uh, detailed in much greater detail in the Lockheed Martin uh, paper. Uh, I strongly recommend that everyone read that if you're into this sort of thing. They actually went over three separate attacks against their environment that use similar commonalities, and they were able to piece it into one advanced persistent threat. How's that vodka? No, oh, it's great. Woo. Uh, so gathering data, you need to embrace being the nosy neighbor on the internet. Uh, IRC, certain groups still love to go and hang out on IRC. I love to hang out on IRC. I don't break any computers though. Um, if you're going to actually start going into these channels where the mistreats hang out, never IRC from devices or networks that can be traced back to you. Uh, groups of bad actors like to have privacy. Uh, you, you should embrace that, but don't tempt fate. Uh, I had a friend, and he posted a uh, honeypot online. He sent it to a select group of people who should know better. And I was talking to him a week after he sent it out to the mailing list that we were all on. And he said, man, I sent that out to the mailing list. I basically told everyone, do not touch this. It's a honeypot. It's actually infected with certain things. Do you realize five people out of that list actually connected to it, and one of them was running XP service back too? <laughs> <laughs> Don't click shit, folks. Um, so due to the nature of IRCs, groups can be harder to infiltrate. If you have five people on an IRC channel, and you're the sixth person, you're going to start, people are going to start asking questions of, hey, who's that? If you know him? No, I don't know him. I thought you knew him. And you're going to get kicked and banned. Um, you need to actually start maybe reaching out to people and introducing yourself, saying, oh, you know, I heard about you guys from X. Big fans of your work. You know, be a Sika fan. So social media. Certain groups love to discuss their exploits on social media. Um, a lot of these groups actually use this as sort of some type of public relations or advertising. Uh, find out who's talking about you and why. Then find out who's talking about to them about you and why. Or just talking to them in general. Uh, it's much easier, thankfully, with the uh, more public nature of Twitter and all these other social media networks to um, 
monitor them because most of them are most people have a public Twitter account, or if you get a you know you have to run across a private Twitter account, you make a request. More often than not, you're approved. Uh, it's much easier to monitor people than IRC. Um, Pastebin. <laughs> I'm just going to stand still for the rest of the talk. Um, so Pastebin is a wretched hive of scum and villainy. However, it is a great source for data. Uh, groups will often pumps, uh, post dumps of stolen data on Pastebin. Uh, it's very easy to access it, and they post they post links to forum or IRC chats. And um, he'll talk about, oh, I have you know 15,000 credit cards from a certain bank or a certain credit card provider, uh, or I have 15,000 customer records from a certain business. Uh, monitor a pastebin for your data. If only you start seeing your customer database advertised on pastebin, chances are you have an incident and you just didn't know about it. Uh, they do have a, a subscription service that will allow you to monitor for certain keywords. I believe it's a monthly fee of five dollars, and it will um, give you a couple extra features along with the search and, uh, with this monitoring capability. I believe you are limited to five keywords. It's also trivial to roll your own monitoring system. If anyone wants to talk about that, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, Google Alerts. Google knows everything about everyone. I'm pretty sure it's Prism itself. Um, leverage this to your advantage. You should start, to, you should start doing manually Googling your, uh, certain, uh, certain things about your businesses on Google to see if anyone else knows about it. Um, you can also use Google Alerts. I have noticed, and I, someone actually pointed, about the, pointed this out to me at Source Boston, and I it found, turned out, it was found out it was true. Uh, Google Alerts will um, sometimes not catch everything in a Google search, so it's always good to have that manual backup and do it by hand, um, uh, rather than just rely on Google Alerts. Uh, Google Alerts and Google searches will yield a high false positive rate, however, it will yield occasional nuggets of good data. So what should you be looking for on all these services? Uh, your company name, the uh, company Twitter handles and or hashtags you like to use, or your marketing people like to use. Uh, domain names for your uh, services, IP addresses. You have one big thing about domain names is find out all the domain names you have registered at preemptively as just, opposed to just the domain names you actually know about. Um, so your CEO sucks.com. Find out what that is and add that to your search list because people might talk talking about it as a way to, geez, they have this redirecting to a server no one knows about, let's go attack that. Uh, so IP addresses, emails and addresses and or um, email addresses of uh, third-party service providers, mm -hmm. uh, names of company leaderships, you know, all the people like to uh, dox people. I can't say that term. Um, and they'll post something similar, oh, you know, it's your CEO and, you know, he lives at this address and you're after your, your, the address they give is your corporate headquarters. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed to release that, but, you know, someone felt really proud and posted that to Pastebin and probably showed everyone. Um, Terms that the people that you're monitoring are actually talking about. If they have some type of, you know, op B sides, start monitoring for that term and see also is talking about it. So um, deep undercover, interacting with bad actors is dangerous, and it's on shaky legal ground as well. If anyone's ever read uh, *Kingpin* by Kevin Polson, uh, they had they one of the more interesting things I learned from it was the FBI protocol for establishing confidential informants. And you have to, if you talk to a certain person three times, you cannot talk to that person a fourth time unless you get approval from, you know, FBI senior management. I don't know exactly what they call it. But you have to prove that this is um, actually valid and you're not actually, they're not attempting to turn you. Uh, anyone who pays attention to the giant trial in Boston will know why this protocol was established. Uh, again, sometimes you will attract attention just by being a fly on the wall. You know, you go into that IRC channel with five persons, you know, they're going to start asking questions again. Uh, developing a believable legend for your persona is necessary and required. Um, need an identity? Namegenerator.in. Um, you go there, I think it's like namegenerator.in slash state name. So if you go state uh, namegenerator.in slash Rhode Island, it will come up with a name and a valid address, a valid, valid phone number, um, basically a 401 area code. Um, address, phone number, and I believe a social security number that is, um, will compute correctly. Uh, very handy tool, um, very easy to generate identities from them. 
Uh, cover identities cannot be created, they can only be grown. When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. Um, and when's the best time to create a cover identity? Uh, a couple years ago, at least. Uh, account set up last week, if you don't, if you suddenly start busting in and just to an IRC channel and people start asking who you are, and you're like, oh man, I've been a fan for your people for years, and I'll change my Twitter account, and you only started tweeting like about uh, you know, three days ago, they're gonna start to become suspicious. If you start today, you may start having a believable identity in about three months. Uh, you can pass it off of, oh yeah, my old uh, handle got you know, burned, uh, I had to change my handle about you know, three months ago, I don't really wanna give it all, uh, my old data out for offset reasons. It actually is kind of believable when interacting with these people. If you start having accounts that are years old, it's gonna, it's like pure gold. Um, you should always have multiple identities good to gold, if one, good to go. If one of them gets burned, you can quickly switch over to a new one. Um, it is harder to start reestablishing yourself with the groups you are monitoring um, if your identity's changed, uh, because if they start, if one of them starts having um, sus uh, questions about you and you change identities and, and don't reestablish your identity, uh, don't reestablish your connection saying, oh, you know, here's my old handle, this is my new handle now. Scuttlebutt may get around that the person who um, does have suspect, does have suspicions on you, may find out that your new identity is being used for other purposes. Um, it's good it's good to have at least five or six identities in the bag that you're constantly tending. And if one of those get burned, you need to create another one. Uh, so quick tip for believability, uh, LinkedIn. Research colleges, majors, and student life uh, for your uh, burner identity. Um, I do, you know, it's, you want to have it so it's believable, but not in Googleable. But if you don't want to go, really want to go in specifics, uh, I found this really great college once. It had a, an unregistered uh, uh, Greek sorority. One of my identities was female. Nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> However, it didn't have a web page, it didn't have a national association, but I put it in the uh, LinkedIn profile, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, Kappa Beta Phi, yeah. Um, if someone does, does start Googling this, they will find out that that uh, sorority did exist within that uh, college, and it was suspended for drinking back in 2003. Uh, you can start using that to believe a believable story, spin, spin the believable story. Uh, Facebook, find friends, create pictures, create events, and uh, start posting stuff onto your Facebook profile. Um, if you're a uh, college person, if you're pretending to be a college person, um, start to talk about college things. You're not gonna be really interested in talking about the geopolitical relations between the United States and Russia. They are gonna start talking about you know, Kim Kardashian or the latest you know, local sports game. Um, Twitter, always tweet on an appropriate schedule. A college student in LA isn't gonna be tweeting on an EST stitch on an ET schedule from nine to five. That's going to look suspicious. There are plenty of scripts out there that will post random um, posts on Twitter at set schedules. Start looking at that, get a cheap server, and start posting to your Twitter account. Also, never ever cross-contaminate accounts. It's very easy to say, well, I have these 10 burner identities, they're all friends with each other, I've established that, you know, I have 10 friends, um, so I can start, you know, it's a little more believable. The problem is, is that if one of those accounts gets uh, earned, those other accounts are going to start coming, becoming suspicious. If you start approaching groups and you say, "Oh, hey, well, I'm you know Joe Schmo, and you know Joe Schmo gets burned," then all of a sudden you come off and say, "Well, hey, you know I'm trying, I'm, I'm a big fan of your work too. I'm you know Joe Joe Blow," and you start seeing that Joe Schmo and Joe Blow are friends on Facebook, people might get uh, suspicious. No, those aren't my actual databases. Um, so, early warning, cover identities aren't just for James Bond, James Bond type <laughs> stuff. Uh, creating flake employees for your business uh, can create an early warning for someone looking into your company. Uh, legitimately, you know, hey, I'm looking for a sales contact for my, you know, Cinematic 5000, are you interested? Also, illegitimately, well, hey, I'm looking for a, uh, I'm looking for a good target to send the spear phishing to. Uh, set up fake work identities on LinkedIn, post their information to Google, and see who pokes at them. You may want to talk to your legal department first. So you have all this information. Um, let's start talking about data sharing. Uh, data sharing, you know, knowing as much information you can during an incident is very key. Uh, sharing with peers can make a difference. Uh, you can aid in time protection, situational awareness, and, you know, if your attack is targeted versus untargeted. 
you have three companies that you know all got the same phishing email, and you have different verticals and different, organiza different organizations and different verticals, you could, chances are it's probably an untargeted attack. Um, sharing, very importantly, means receiving and also giving. If you have information, you shouldn't have a problem with sharing it with other, with other groups. Um, you should produce information, and you can also that will establish that you're actually attempting to do this for the greater good, rather than attempt to take information and hoard it. Federal government. Um, so some of the groups, there are a bunch of groups out there that uh, do share information. Um, there are unorganized and formal communities. Um, never underestimate the power of networking. Um, introverted geeks, this means you. Um, it's very hard to come out of your shell, but it will pay off dividends when you actually start getting this information. Uh, just grin and bear it. Plus, you know, when you're talking to a bunch of these, just remember that your peers are also a bunch of introverted geeks, so it's not that big of a deal. Uh, there are numerous communities in local areas, mostly in Boston. Um, Bean Set, uh, Granite Set, which is in New Hampshire, um, Mass Hackers, which is also in Boston, and also local chapters of uh, national organizations. I believe. Um, I can't remember if it's ISSA or ISACA, who has a Rhode Island chapter ISACA. saying, hmm? ISACA. ISACA. So go over and talk to them, find out where the meeting is, start establishing contacts. Uh, there are also um, organized informal communities that are, that are organized to facilitate data sharing. Uh, they're closed, communicate, and they're closed, so they're kind of hard to get into. Most of these are mailing lists. Uh, unfortunately, their membership requirements are don't call us, we'll call you. Uh, if you start establishing yourself in these unorganized informal communities and say, oh, hey, this guy shares really good information, you may start running across someone who is part of one of these organized informal communities, and you say, well, geez, that guy is actually pretty good, that guy, or girl, pardon me, is pretty good and actually shares information. You know, let's go invite them in and, you know, we can share information with them because they're pretty cool. Um, they are great sources, however, it does depend widely on the community itself. Um, and again, they can also be a bear to get into unless you start establishing yourself. InfraGuard, it's a partnership between the uh, FBI and private sector. Uh, actually, they just had their um, regional meeting uh, last Thursday. Lots of good talks. Jack Daniel was there. Um, his uh, joke about, you know, be Jack Daniel being a name as hobby actually did elicit a couple of laughs. Um, so InfraGuard is still a good network opportunity. Um, they actually highly encourage you to go and trade business cards and talk to people and find people of like interest. Um, so they do it at the beginning of uh, their regional meeting. Uh, they have a private secure portal. Apparently they set it up and was delayed a bit due to uh, certain budget cuts. Um, and recently they've actually started releasing um, Department of Homeland Security joint information bulletins. The quality of them, well, okay, let's just talk about my uh, thoughts on THS advisories 140 characters. Uh, I got this piece of information, it was a Friday, it was a 4 p.m., I ran through all of our systems and I get a ton of hits off this one IP, and I start panicking because I see a bunch of 80 and 443 traffic going to it, and I go, oh, wow, this, this one, it's a Friday, it's a 4 p.m., why did I look at this? I run it through who is? It's Amazon.com. <laughs> Needless to say, I, I, I was displeased. It wasn't AWS, it was Amazon.com. So it also explains why I had a ton of people going. Uh, ISACs, uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center. They were established by the federal government, I believe, in the early 2000s to facilitate information sharing in a uh, cybersecurity manner before everyone started calling it cybersecurity. Let's give a portion of the drink. Got to wash my mouth out after saying cyber. Um, so there are formal communities that are established within certain verticals uh, finance, energy, uh, state governments, health, higher education. Uh, I was kind of surprised how many have it actually propped up within the past three or four years when I last checked on these. Um, the communities vary widely between ISACs. I participated in two, uh, one of which has a very good peer-to-peer -peer model. They set up a bunch of mailing lists. They encourage you to uh, collaborate together. Uh, the one I was previously in, they had a SOC. You sent information to the SOC. The SOC took it and did something with it. I assume they had black robes and ceremonial knives. Um, and occasionally, if they just deemed it worthy enough, they sent it out to all the other groups. Um, I wasn't a giant fan of that model. I am a more fan of the model that, we cur that I'm currently in. Um, they are not free. They often cost a lot of money per year. However, I find that they are worth it, especially if you have no data currently flowing into your um, organization now from any peer institutions. 
Uh, also up in the uh, Boston area, a little kind of northward, um, is the Advanced Cyber Security Center, ECSC. Essentially what it is is a multi-vertical ISAC. Uh, they have weekly meetings on threat evaluation and information sharing. And uh, they're kind of young. I believe they're about three years old at this point. They are growing. They've grown by leaps and bounds from when I used to participate in them with my previous job. Uh, also, they're not free. I believe they're about $50,000 a year, which is peanuts when you're in the private sector. Active defense, another buzzword that are coming out. Um, embrace your home field advantage. So currently, right now, we're always calling the same play. We always use the same tools. We have firewalls. We have IDP. Yes, we have antivirus, so we have Windows, and we use Windows in our environment. Or if you use Linux, we usually use Red Hat, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Mm -hmm. The attackers know this, they've adapted their methods. Um, if they come across a Sun OS 5 box, they're probably not going to have an exploit uh, ready for it. Um, they may have to go and search in their bag of tricks and find one of the numerous security holes in Sun OS 5. But um, it's not something they're going to be expecting. Uh, so defense has really stayed stagnant uh, while the uh, attackers have continued to develop new tools. Uh, Josh Corman, uh, he's a really smart guy. He's on Twitter. I highly recommend you follow him, or if you have a chance to see him talk, do so. He came up with something called H.D. Moore's Law, and the casual attacker's power grows at the rate of Metasploit. So if your defenses can't put up with Metasploit, you're going to have a whole world of pain coming up, knocking at your front doors and just working itself. So, Active defense, and uh, I think every time I say active defense, I actually have to give Paul five cents. Um, so active defense is not hacking back. Uh, hacking back, questionable legality. Um, hacking, uh, active defense is not attribution. If you come across the person, hands on keyboard, is hacking to your network, you think you have attribution, and all of a sudden you look at his or her um, uh, bank account and sees $100,000 mysteriously appear from a wire transfer of the week before, you still haven't attrib attributed it. Um, active defense is not retaliation. You should never fight angry. It's you know, one of those big kung fu things. As soon as you fight angry, you lose the battle. Um, of course, one of the big things that you know, a couple of companies are going, oh, we're doing strategic counter strikes. Um, if, you do, if you eliminate a command and control server, you're not going to eliminate the problem. I mean, how many exploitable boxes out there for, another, for an attacker to find to reestablish their command and control infrastructure? It's not hard. So what is active defense? Um, active defense is four things. Delay, deception, detection, and disruption. We want to slow them down. We want to make them wonder where the heck the data they're looking for is. Um, we want to find them to make know, know that they're actually on our network. And we want to eventually, once we do that, we want to deny them their access. So uh, why active defense? It's basically, it's increasing attacker talk. Either the bad actors will move on to another target if you're not specifically targeted. Or if there's someone's pulling the strings and actively targeting you, they may go and stop the current attack and move on to another higher gun. Um, mind games. If you want to keep them off, the, if keep the attacker off balance, if the bad actors think everything is a trap, they're going to start being overly cautious. And quite frankly, you should use it because it's an uncommonly used tactic. So uh, delay. Use honeypots. Make sure that they're internally facing. If you have an extern if you've ever run an externally facing honeypot, you know that they get a ton of junk in it. Signal noise ratio drops dramatically as soon as you turn them on. Uh, honeypot is always a double edged sword because if you use a high interaction honeypot and actually run vulnerable services, chances are they make it owned. And if you don't detect that they're owned, you have, just have another pivot point on your network. Um, if you have underutilized servers, you should consider running, um, uh, running additional services on them as long as you have an active batch management program. If the bad actors are looking for SQL servers, what happens if they find 5,000 SQL servers in your environment? So, um, deceive. Uh, put interesting files on open shares. Uh, corporate forecast 1H2014. That's going to be very interesting for an attacker. Uh, put a web bug in it that calls to an offsite server. Customer DB backup dot zip, you know, a 12 gigabyte zip file of dead random with a 36 character alphanumeric password. Good luck, guys. Um, <laughs> if you want to generate these fake databases, there's another uh, website out there called fakenamegenerator.com. Uh, I believe they have a free service and a pay service. I believe with the free service, you can generate 50,000 identities within about 10 minutes. Just say, yes, you know, please generate that for me, and here's my email address. The email is this wonderful uh, tab-separated value file of just data. Um, oh, I missed on my slide. So let's go. Demo time. Commence the finish. So nothing up my sleeve. We have my um, 
Here's my uh, Gmail box for my, uh, one of my accounts. And I have a couple of files here. Now, um, two, of these are, uh, two, two of these are files that I would assume that an attacker would be very interested in. I'm going to enter the CEO's top secret file. Dot, dot. Chuck, 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 chuck. I love, I love running on old hardware. Of course, it's a lot faster. So, unfortunately, it's the CEO's diary. You know, last night I dreamed I was printing the board of directors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> however, when this file opened up, and I'm, assuming, I'm praying that the mo got to like me. Yeah. There we go. Called into my web server, and right now we have this. Remote address, um, right? This is a very skeletal framework. I'll be li releasing it soon. Um, this is a unique identifier to that file. I created a what I created. If I look into it, if I show you, yeah. there we go. This is the actual file. Despite it being a .doc file, it's actually just an HTML file, and it has a certain uh, style sheet in there that refers to a um, refers to a file called Project Woolly Mammoth Word CSS. Um, Project Woolly Mammoth is a unique identifier. I'm generating a file that basically calls it either project or operation and shoot just two random words. Um, once there, it actually goes, the phone's on my web server, it finds out what file was requested and then sends me an email of it. Uh, you can also do this with Excel files. However, it is slightly harder uh, because once happens, so I have corporate strategy.exls. Excel will file it. However, a layout you say, hey, this kind of looks weird. Are you sure you want to open it? Um, so that isn't as elegant as the word file. So we have the uh, corporate. Oh, I actually click, see. I'm a security guy. Click no. <laughs> so it will actually um, open the file. It will look like an Excel file. It actually have .xls at the end, and it will still have the same thing. And so this is a different thing. Though. The ID is different. So, you know, web bugs are simple. I'm wondering, I'm, this is a very basic framework. The hard part is actually writing the administrative interface because I can't den design HTML for crap. Um, so, I actually am going to release this. Actually, take a look at my GitHub um, on github.com slash Uh I will be posting it shortly. And all of its bad HTML will be. Um, it's one of the things is the tech. So monitor your systems at the latency. Like the Hawk and Pinnacle. If you're not monitoring that email address, that gets the alerts. You're, you know, why even bother have that? Um, establish some motion sensors. Essentially, route a few network segments to a tar pit. It doesn't have to be um, anything on that tar pit. Just take a couple of slash 24s and have them on your border gateway. Um, route it somewhere. Once that happens, once any type of activity goes to that. Uh, well, sorry, monitor your firewalls and once any activity goes to those subnets, something is happening on your network, be it a misconfigured, misconfigured server or someone's actually scanning. Uh, keep an eye on your traditional alerting systems as well. The Ambient in their 2013 report talked uh, briefly about a uh, organization that was infiltrated by a BT I'm not sure this time. Um, because I'm running short on time. And so they actually did pick up all of their initial, you know, hacks or tools like a password cracker on their antivirus. The unfortunate side of it is that no one was monitoring the logs. And so they were infiltrated for about three months before they realized it, and they actually had the alerts that when the, per when the attacker established their initial total. Uh, so disrupt. Uh, find them and destroy them. Or if you really want to get into it, you can, you can just keep them on your network and monitor to see exactly what they are if they're after. Um, if you have incident response staff, please keep them consuming a large amount of antacids and maybe some alcohol if they're off duty, and it also is very risky. So would you like to know more? Paul.com, go ahead and talk to him. I believe actually there's another talk after this one um, talking about uh, active defense and offensive countermeasures. Uh, Paul and John and uh, Black Hills Information Security created the uh, active defense harboring distribution. It's a blue CD. They're attempting to establish um, a alternative for uh, Backtrack or Kali Linux for a defensive mindset. Uh, I'm actually going to start attempting to build the um, Alpha into the, which is the webbox system, onto uh, ADHD. So, quick uh, talk about putting it all together. All these techniques are useless unless you start tying them together. Uh, around April, July 2012, 
Oh, we uh, had on my uh, work a noticeable increase in malware spam alerts. Uh, Verizon, American Airlines, United Airlines, USPS, PayPal, Facebook. Um, they were, this was a fairly wise and significant event. A lot of people were reporting that they were getting these type of spam alerts. Uh, they weren't targeted against a single individual uh, company or vertical. Uh, this is a demo of one of these. Um, if any of you have done, were doing in-service response this time, you probably saw something similar. You know, essentially, oh yeah, you charge your credit card at $11 billion, you know, if this, you think this is wrong, please click here. Of course, people are going to click stuff. Um, a large majority of these fan rooms have commonality. They're all the same kind of word. Okay, by the way, we charge you an obscene amount of money. Please click here if you don't, if you don't think this is right. Uh, a similar list of targets. Uh, my organization, there was about a, a bunch of people. One of them was very in tune with this, and we told once uh, he or she reported that this was uh, Problem. He or she kept her eyes out. Oh, sorry, darn it. She kept her eyes out, reported it into us, and we actually got a lot of alerts before anyone, uh, before any of our systems actually detected a hit on it. She would say, "Oh, by the way, I just got this. They're probably targeting us again." Uh, so they're all using the black collect white kit. They all had similar URL structures on the alerts, and they're mostly pushing zoops. Uh, there were some other runs that were different. We're not sure if that was the same group. Uh, the, the smoking guns, the exploit kit, all had two styles of URLs. They all went to an IP address, they all had straightthread.php, and they had 16 hexadecimal digits. I actually found out later um, at Source Boston that this ID might have been part of Black Hole's exploit as a service, which is sad that they have that. Um, so we saw showthread.php and page.php. So what we were able to do is we basically concluded that a single group of actors were probably behind this campaign. We adjusted our defenses to locate URLs with page.php and showthread.php with hex strings. We originally configured the IDSs to do showthread.php, but users showthread.php as a default page. PHP BB2, lots of false positives. Then we adjusted it to look for those hex strings. That greatly reduced it. Um, we were able to check malware spam runs often before they were reported. Uh, turns out we were right. Uh, Trend Micro in July released a black hole exploit kit, a spam campaign, not a series of individual spam runs, and released it July 12, 2012. They reached similar conclusions, and the campaign really started to sputter about that. So, conclusions. Uh, you are the best tool to defend your network. I will fully admit that I'm a tool. Uh, <laughs> get passionate. You need to be passionate if you really like this, and we're very lucky that if you're in information security, most likely you actually like what you're doing. Um, if you're not, Good luck. Uh, stop thinking about threats and really start worrying about actors. Uh, there's time to stop, start being nice and st start playing dirty. And I basically learn who's talking about you and why, and you can probably start developing an intelligence system just by looking into that. Uh, I have like two minutes for questions. Anyone? I just either bored you silly or I don't know, you're all basking in my aura. I'm going to, I'm going to assume it's the latter. Uh, my contact information, if anyone wants to come by and talk to me afterwards, thank you for coming very much. Thank you for very much for coming. And uh, I was able to do this in 50 minutes. Wow. So, my name is Mike Perez. I'm going to be giving a talk that is aimed at people.